Kathmandu Valley has a bowl-shaped structure, which means it lacks the elevation to easily disperse pollutants, especially during winter when the temperatures and wind flows are at low. During winter season, many of us, even those without pulmonary issues, have faced issues like uh, itchy eyes and dry eyes and coughing. In the past, we've had schools shut down due to the low quality of air. This week, World Bank released a report that has warned that even if the measures that are in place are fully implemented, we might not be able to attain the quality of air that we want by the deadline of 2030. Now, what does this mean for South Asia, for Nepal and Kathmandu? To talk more on this, today in Kantipu News, we have with us atmospheric scientist Dr. Aruniko Pandey, who has also in recent time explored and ventured into the political arena. Dr. Pandey, welcome to Kantipa News. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. What exactly is the scenario of air quality in our country in Kathmandu? We have a situation where we have a, a large city sitting at the bottom of a bowl-shaped valley where the local pollution only gets ventilated out of the valley during the daytime. And in the evening, you get a pollution peak building up, which is more severe in winter when a lot of the rush hour and a lot of the emissions still take place after sunset, after the, the hills start cooling down and you start getting cold air accumulating at the valley bottom. Pollution that gets emitted in the valley in the evening stays within the valley air, slightly above the ground until morning, and in the morning it mixes down to the surface again and you have a second peak in pollution in the morning. That's driven by the meteorology and it even takes place on Banda days or even on like Dasai when there is not the regular rush hour traffic. So it's not just traffic determined, it's also meteorology determined. But we also have a situation in the Kathmandu Valley where if you go up to a hillside two days apart, you can have a day when you can clearly see all the buildings across the whole valley in the Himal beyond. And two days later, you only have one or two kilometer visibility. Nothing has changed within the valley. Within the valley, the emissions are the same. The traffic patterns, the human activities are the same. What's the, the difference between the two days is whether the valley is facing, is experiencing air pollution coming in from outside the valley. Within Kathmandu city, only about 30% of the pollution is local. So even if Balan Shah did everything he can to reduce pollution within the valley, he can only reduce 30% on average over the year. Somewhere around 55% or so is from the rest of Nepal and 10-15% from outside of Nepal. So on annual average, motor vehicles, industries, all of those play a big role. But the times with really the worst air pollution, it's usually when there is agricultural fires taking place or forest fires taking place. Across the season, Worst air quality usually in Kathmandu is in winter mornings. And a lot of that is local sources within the valley that cannot be ventilated out because you have a pool of cold air sitting at the valley bottom pushing the pollution down. Um, also because it's cold, people tend to burn garbage and have more heaters running and things. So there is local pollution that makes the ground level pollution within the valley quite bad. But uh, if you recall about a year and a half ago, we had this air pollution emergency when sh schools had to shut down. That was mostly when there were really bad forest fires taking place, where he had smoke from forest fires in the hills around Kathmandu and beyond blowing into the city. The interesting finding from the last six or seven years, as the Department of Environment and Partners started installing air quality stations in other cities in Nepal, was the realization that Kathmandu really does not have the worst air quality in Nepal. A lot of cities in the Tarai have really bad air quality as well, and even rural areas as well. In the world, I think nine out of the 10 most polluted cities in the world are in this region. And many places have air quality that is 10 or 20 times above the WHO standards average across the year. So air quality is bad. It is responsible for about 2 million excess deaths per year in South Asia, 30, 40,000 a year in Nepal, which is three, four times as much as what the earthquake in 2015 killed. So it is a major problem and it does need to be addressed. This brings into picture the contribution that transboundary air pollution has in what we experience in our country. What is the pattern like and what's being done? Well, if you look at Northern South Asia from a satellite, you don't see national boundaries. You see one large polluted area that extends from beyond Lahore in Pakistan across Northern India, Southern Nepal to Bangladesh, the Indo-Gangetic Plains. That is one of the most polluted regions in the world. And air flows easily across borders, obviously. So whatever takes place in that region, um, the pollution goes across the borders. In Kathmandu, the World Bank report shows that somewhere between 10 and 15% of the pollution across the year is due to transboundary pollution. But of course, we have days. For example, if farmers are burning rice straw in northern Punjab in November, and a day across the all of Punjab, the next day, if the air comes straight to Kathmandu, we can have one or two kilometer visibility and flights canceled in Kathmandu 
because of that. So in those days, then maybe it could be 80% or more of the pollution here coming from across the border. Air does not recognize national boundaries, and it's the whole region that is affected. The report makes a very good case for regionally coordinated addressing of air pollution in order to get it down. And the good news is that um, generally addressing air pollution near the sources has a lot of benefit for the source regions as well. And so the sources of pollution are the people around there benefit the most from cleaning up the pollution. But uh, finding the most cost-effective way of reducing air pollution across the whole region uh, does involve a lot of coordination, um, sharing of data, uh, sharing of um, the best measures for uh, cutting down air pollution. What efforts and policies have there been taken or are in plan in your observation between Nepal and other members of the region? For people in atmospheric science, we have been quite aware of regional transboundary air pollution for probably the last 15, 18 years or so since there have been wide-scale satellite observations, since there have been ship observations off the coast of Maldives and the coast of India, finding the regional air pollution. It's gradually filtering into the minds of people that air pollution is a serious issue. It's, a, it's something that there's not a single source, and therefore not a single magic bullet for cleaning it up. Uh, you need a multi-pronged approach everywhere. Garbage burning in the Kathmandu Valley can be a very large source, can be a quarter of the pollution in winter mornings that is locally manageable by the municipalities and should be addressed because it will end up improving air, the air that people breathe within this, the valley. The same can be done elsewhere. Cutting down on agricultural fires can also be important seasonally. What is important is that just cleaning up locally will not clean up the air quality in Kathmandu or in Delhi if the surrounding regions, the surrounding countries don't do anything. So there is a need for discussion at political levels. There is a 20 plus year old uh, agreement called the Mali Declaration, something on transboundary air pollution. It hasn't, it so far has been a forum to bring policymakers together for discussion every couple of years, but there's a need for a lot more understanding of the need for coordination across the region. This report also states that even if all the measures that are in place are fully implemented, we might not be able to improve the air quality to the extent that we want by 2030. What does this mean? The measures that are in place today, it means that there's a need for more measures across the region. I mean, if you just look at within Nepal, the vehicular emissions control measures, it's mostly for smaller, for smaller four-wheel vehicles, the green sticker. Um, it, hasn't, it doesn't really include the diesel trucks, it doesn't include motorbikes. There's a lot more that can be done to reduce vehicle emission by finding ways of enforcing better maintenance of vehicles and better, better standards for vehicles. Um, if you look at the number of garbage fires that take place, yes, there's been a ban on garbage fires within the city, but there's still there's a lot more that can be done. But So enforcing those measures that are already in place is a start, but there's a need for more measures and a wider set of um, sectors. For example, within Nepal we still have several million households that cook with solid fuels, with firewood, with um, dried uh, animal dung. Obviously if you look at the ceilings in those kitchens, some of the smoke coming from those cooking fires coats the ceiling and doesn't go outside of the houses. But a large fraction still does escape out into the outdoors, so cooking indoors with solid fuel still is an outdoor air pollution problem as well as an indoor air pollution problem. So switching to cleaner cooking fuels, for example, yes, it helps reduce the consumption of firewood, helps protect our forest, but it also is very important for public health. In fact, probably about two thirds of deaths due to air pollution in Nepal are because of indoor air pollution from cooking. How do you see the air pollution scenario evolving in the years to come? I'd like to be optimistic. I think it's a, it's a solvable problem. It, um, over the course of a decade, South Asia is able to achieve clean air in a cost-effective way. The, the solutions are relatively simple. There's also a lot of places that we can see how they've managed to address air pollution. For Kathmandu, a good example is looking at Mexico City, which is another city in a bowl-shaped valley that 20, 25 years ago had the worst, world's worst air pollution, and now it's it has made big improvements, and it, it wasn't a single magic solution. It was stepwise, little steps at a time, shutting down that refinery, improving fuel standards, 
uh, improving the public transport system. It's, it's like lots of little steps. The solutions are fairly straightforward and they make economic sense for the most part. And they make sense in terms of public health and overall for the well-being of the country. So to me, it's a relatively temporary problem. We saw during COVID lockdown, suddenly you could see the Himal from the Tarai and from Northern India when the pollution sources got turned off. Um, it's not like the loss of biodiversity or some of the climate change issues where it will take, uh, where the, the damage is permanent. You turn off the air pollution sources and things clean up fairly easily. So I'm optimistic that air pollution across all of North and South Asia can be cleaned up. It does pl take political commitment, both at local levels as well as national levels, and it requires it being a topic of debate in SARC, BBIN, whatever international um, fora there are. It requires our heads of state to talk about air pollution with each other and to recognize that it benefits all of us across the whole region if we clean up air pollution. Now, you've recently ventured into politics mm -hmm. as well. You said the fact that, the realization in fact, that you needed to be at a policy making level to actually be able to make a substantial change. How has it been so far? Well, for me personally, it's been a very interesting journey this year. Um, coming as a scientist into politics, there's a lot of learning. Um, in, as long as I was doing science research, it was all about building knowledge one brick at a time. And then once you've established something, that's how it is in politics. What is the truth? What is not, what is not the truth? Which advice is valid? Which advice is not? It's something that's constantly shifting. It's more of playing a game that I'm still learning how to play. But I, I came into politics with a strong realization that just having the knowledge about what needs to be done is insufficient. It also needs to be part of the national narrative and not just air pollution, but also climate change and some of the other issues that we're facing in Nepal. How has your party viewed climate change issues? Climate change is one of the major challenges that Nepal will face that governments to date have not sufficiently addressed. It's been very clear to us that it's going to be one of the big challenges that Nepal will face. We already saw a year and a half ago with the floods in Melamchi that places and infrastructure that have been safe for a long time will not stay safe if climate change keeps changing, if temperatures keep increasing. It requires us to approach things from two, in two ways. One, within Nepal to adapt to the climate change that is taking place that is beyond our control. So how do we build our roads? How do we build our bridges? How do we build the bridges so they don't get washed away? Where do we need to safeguard our settlements that are in the riverbanks? What places are vulnerable to landslides? Where in northern Nepal are there places that used to mostly get snow, but because of climate change start getting rain and therefore a lot of soil and debris washing down um, into our rivers? Where are there hydropower plants that are at risk, both because of glacial lake outburst floods, but also because of the filling of the reservoirs with debris? We are facing an increasingly challenging situation that requires being very mindful of the climate risks in our infrastructure planning and in setting up early warning systems and making sure that the most vulnerable people are not going to be affected the most by climate change. But that's within Nepal. Globally, Nepal needs to take a much stronger role in leadership on climate issues. Um, at the moment, Bangladesh is having a, has a much louder voice uh, internationally on climate change issues. Bangladesh is affected strongly as well, but Nepal has the home of Sagarmata, of some of the highest mountains in the world. We have a way of, and as a place that historically has been a neutral, peaceful place where people can come together, we need to play a much bigger role in the international climate debate, pushing other countries towards mitigation of climate change, towards um, limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. Dr. Bandit, thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure.